The FTX collapse is basically what happens when you let a bunch of teenagers be in charge of the second largest cryptocurrency exchange worth billions of dollars without any regulation and ask, what could go wrong? Unlike the popular thing to say in certain circles that nobody could have known, like for example, those large finance YouTubers. In May and June, one of the big things I was saying is, you're going to see subscriberships or, or these sponsorships dry up. And so I pumped them as much as I could. We're just like, every video gets a, a sponsorship. So I'm like, these are going to go away. So when I saw this, like when we're like, oh, wow, FTX is drying up. Well, that's not a surprise. That shit wasn't converting anyway. It was stupid of them to spend the money they were. Like we were literally in the office like, how do they have so much money to spend on sponsoring us when they don't even convert that well? And I talked to my team and they're like, we don't know, but FTX says they just have a lot of money that they have to spend. And I'm like, this is stupid. This is a bubble. Whatever. We'll put them in a bunch of videos because they're not a bad platform, but they're wasting their damn money. So we saw the writing on the wall. Uh, I don't like, I, I, I don't sponsor stuff that I think is stupid or bad for the consumer. I don't think FTX is bad for the consumer. And I actually turned down a Coinbase sponsorship for like $15,000 because I'm like, I'm not confident about, about Coinbase. So I turned that down. I'm not confident about that. So I didn't do it. But, uh, but, but FTX, I'm like, yeah, this is going to go away. So Ah, uh -huh. so they knew something was wrong with FTX, but wanted to quickly pump out videos with mentions to take as much money as possible. How could they have known? Red flags. Lots and lots of red flags. Sam Bankman Fried, or SBF, initially founded Alameda Research in 2017 to trade crypto, mainly by trading arbitrage, specifically buying crypto in the US, then selling it in Japan where prices were usually 10% higher. Unsatisfied with how crypto exchanges functioned, FTX was then founded in 2019 in Hong Kong as a crypto exchange. Fun fact, did you know that in Asian exchanges, red is used for up and green for down, the opposite of Western exchanges? Just pointing this out because this thing is very, very red. The obvious connection here is that FTX was specifically founded so that Alameda can have trading advantages. Trading advantages that Alameda did use, for example, exempting Alameda from FTX auto liquidation protocols, or using inside knowledge to front run the market and sell crypto at inflated prices. Although they still somehow managed to lose $10 billion. A $10 billion hole which appeared in FTX's balance sheet. What has most likely happened is that Alameda Research took FTX customer money to cover their trading losses. Presumably, SBF assumed that the bank in his name gave him enough license to act like one and lend money to borrowers, because you know, otherwise this would be illegal. SBF and his nine other roommates are basically running the crypto hedge fund Alameda Research and the crypto exchange FTX in a penthouse in the Bahamas, and all 10 of them are, or used to be, romantically involved with each other. The 30-year-old ex-billionaire who people once called a genius with a savior complex has typed in an interview with a Vox reporter saying, fuck regulators, and that they don't protect customers at all, which may be a 400 IQ conversation to have right after his own two companies declared bankruptcy for doing what is possibly very illegal stuff. He later said that he didn't know what he said would be made public, even though he was talking to a reporter, and then turned around and said that regulators are great. Maybe this is what true genius is like, but I'm not sure. I don't have two parents who are Stanford law professors, and neither did I play League of Legends while having a conference call with investors, later raising a billion dollar and a meme round of $420 million from 69 investors. It must take a special kind of genius to be bronze in LOL after only hundreds of matches, given that investors seem to be impressed, like Sequoia Capital, which deliberately included the fact that he played LOL while in the call in their magazine-style article. Apparently, investors were also impressed by the spreadsheet sent by SBF, which according to Fortune, appear to be homespun Excel files, which are at times confusing and have inaccurate labels. They do not provide a clear accounting of how FTX was valuing its various tokens or liabilities when calculating figures such as net profits. A look at a page of the Excel sheet on the Financial Times mentions that the value of assets and liabilities have a chance of typos, and that they are hidden, poorly, internally labelled fiat account. A disclaimer that I, I am not a billionaire, so I don't know, maybe 
profits don't mean anything for businesses owned by billionaires. Maybe well-organized accounting is something only poor people do. Other geniuses would include the CEO of Alameda Research, Caroline Ellison, a 28-year-old whose only trading experience before FTX was 19 months as a junior trader at Jane Street. Yeah, I would say yeah, it was, it was kind of daunting. And yeah, mostly just sort of it was uh, something I wasn't used to thinking about. So it was sort of, I don't know, I guess I was like a, a trader for, I mean, not that long at Jane Street, but a year and a half, which was kind of more trading experience than a lot of Alameda traders had at the time. I kind of wanted to come in and be like an expert on everything, but there were still like lots of stuff in the crypto world that I knew nothing about. So, Since the collapse, her LinkedIn has been deleted, although her Twitter is still there. The most interesting of which is her Tumblr blog, which we know to be her since a 7th March 2021 post linked to her Twitter profile opened in the same month. And it is from this blog that we gather some nuggets of information, like some cute boy things are controlling most major world governments, and low risk aversion, and that the FTX and Alameda execs in the Bahamas are likely in some kind of relationship as messed up as their organizational chart. In a response to a question asking why shouldn't use infinite leverage because your potential losses stay fixed at all your investment, Caroline explains that brokers tend to set the margin requirements conservative enough so it's unlikely for people to lose all their money, while also saying that traditional finance is a lot more boring and that people who don't infinitely do double or nothing coin flips forever are lame, and that she endorses high leverage. Incidentally, Sam Bankrupt Man also had a Twitter thread with a similar thought experiment, and he mentioned the Kelly Criterion, which is the optimal theoretical size, meaning how much of your money in your portfolio should you put into a bet for the most returns. This is a math formula, an elementary school concept to express the relationship between given quantities, meaning assuming we know the numbers involved, we can just plug the numbers in to get an answer. Scammed your bank account man says that he would probably do more like 50,000, even though Kelly suggests that he should only bet 10, which is not how math formulas work, as someone in the comments pointed out repeatedly. But I guess some fried bank account man only has a physics degree. I mean, gambler's ruin and the Kelly criterion are the kind of thing that you would expect quant trading firms to do. It's part of something called um, risk management. Definitely not something you'd expect from a physics graduate with only a minor in mathematics. It's kind of the thing that would really be useful if a trading firm hired, say, someone with an actual math degree. Do you think that you have been able to pull this thing off without your mathematics degree or it has been the pillar of your trading activity? Uh, yeah, absolutely could pull it off without my math degree. <laughs> use very little math. Um, use a lot of like uh, elementary school math, like uh, arithmetic, probability, uh, but not really any of the advanced stuff I learned in college. Or perhaps a question we should ask is why is Shem Conman so willing to take risk? First of all, he's not risking his own money, he's risking yours. What are you going to do? Find him in the Bahamas? The second is drugs, specifically amphetamine, which is used for treating ADHD or when not prescribed by a doctor, used as a stimulant. Stimulated Brain Man has also admitted to using stimulants on Twitter. The question is, what? Autism Capital on Twitter identified it as AMSM, which is used to treat patients with Parkinson's and depression by increasing serotonin levels. Also you're not supposed to eat meat with Emsa, which really brings another meaning to veganism. More importantly, even if you don't give a shit about what people do in their private lives, meds for Parkinson's have been linked to hypersexuality, compulsive buying, binge eating, and the important part, compulsive gambling. As this article puts it, Patients often lack insight and underestimate the presence and severity of impulse control disorders and related conditions. Now, I'm not saying that the drugs did in fact cause all this to happen. It's possible that they simply have ADHD or something. And a blog post by Astro Codex 10 cites further studies to say that the compulsive gambling part may actually be pretty rare. The post also notes that the dosage and what other drugs they take matters in deciding how much influence the drug has. I'm just saying that it all lined up very perfectly. Which would explain why after the bankruptcy filing, Fried Brain Man still found it a good idea to send a letter to FTX employees. And he doesn't seem to understand what he did wrong. 
citing potential interest in billions of dollars of funding and return value to customers and save the business. Sam, stop using new investor money to pay off all customers. I'm not saying it's a Ponzi scheme, but it certainly sounds like one. And it's not even the first time you did this. Can you can you comment on like the sustainability of that? Like, yeah, because like, you know, on the one hand, you're like, well, a trillion dollars of institutional money is going to come into Bitcoin. On the other hand, you're like, basically, there are a lot of Ponzi's that have done really well. <laughs> right. So <laughs> let me. OK, cool. I'll stay on the cynical <laughs> route. Think about like cynically what could happen here. Well, OK, so you've got I mean, this box is kind of dumb. But like, what's the end game? Right. This box is worth zero, obviously. And like that, you know, you can't like keep this market cap or something but on the other hand if everyone kind of now thinks that this box token is worth about a billion dollar market cap that's what people are pricing it at and sort of has that market cap everyone's going to market to market in fact you can even finance this right you can put x token in a borrow lending protocol and borrow dollars with it if you think it's worth like less than two-thirds of that you you, you could even just like put some in there take the dollars out and never never you know give the dollars back and just get liquidated eventually and it is sort of like real monetizable stuff in some senses and you know at some point like if the world never decides that we were wrong about this in like a coordinated way right like you're kind of the guy calling bullshit and saying no this thing's actually worthless but in what sense are you right yeah anyway another thing brought up by astro codex 10 is that he or she is surprised that FTX's performance coach gave an interview to the New York Times because of doctor-patient confidentiality. In the interview, Dr. Lerner described FTX as being undersexed, if anything. Employees were working too much and would have been healthier if they had more healthy dating relationships. But in the email interview with Vice, Dr. Lerner also said that his interactions with SBF focused more on employee happiness and retention and organizational structure, and that he didn't really see the top executives like Gary Wang and Nishat Singh. Speaking of which, Zixiao Gary Wang, chief technology officer for both FTX and Alameda Research and co-founder of both firms, is perhaps the second or third most important person in this collapse. As CTO, it's likely that he was involved in the accounting software backdoor to move customer assets. But strangely, aside from knowing that he was a Google intern, about three photos and a few pages, including this stupid website, we know basically nothing about him. Nishat Singh, early employee at Alameda and co-founder of FTX, is director of engineering at FTX. Similarly, he would have controlled the code and corporate funds. The four above are, given their early role, what we know to have the most decision making in this scam. As for other executives, red flags. Like, Sam Trebuco, who was co-CEO with Caroline and then very conveniently left FTX months before the whole thing went kaboom. Sam Trebuco, also known as Sam Tabasco, known for counter-trading their customers. You know, because they know the people in FTX literally trading in the same house and then tweeted, am I the best trader in the world? I don't get it. Why are they confessing? They're not confessing. They're bragging. The chief operating officer for FTX only had two years of risk management experience at Credit Suisse. You know, the firm that only had a few scandals just the past two years. And she wasn't even a director or anything, just an analyst. Indeed, who could have seen this coming? So, a bunch of incompetent teenagers near the top of an organization. Just a bunch of immature little red flags. But oh boy, the next profile is one big fat shimmering red flag. Dan Friedberg. FTX's chief regulatory officer seems almost scripted for this role. Sort of like if you wanted a criminal lawyer, he's the exact man you want for the job. The kind of lawyer guilty people hire. What? You're the kind of lawyer guilty people hire. Because this guy conveniently left out his most prominent roles, his involvement in two online poker businesses that collapsed and took $50 million in customer deposits, and also him covering up the ultimate bad poker scandal where a group of people used cheating software on several accounts to cheat other poker players out of tens of millions in poker winnings. Although they were caught, most of the group practically got away scot-free with the exception of Russ Hamilton's reputation, keeping the tens of millions of customer deposits. Daniel Friedberg escaped serious scrutiny 
as the ultimate Beck consigliere, protecting Pearson and Helmuth interests. In leaked recordings, he advocates a cover-up of felony behavior, yet continues to hold a practicing law license in the U.S. Five years after the cases were settled and certain statutes of limitations had passed, audio recordings were leaked. I went back, I spent a year, and this is just a personal note, I spent a year and a half of my life in Canada. And what was it for? It was to get $23 million to you guys for IPO. And then you went on and you cheated. You took $16 million from players. So you took $40 million out of this thing. And Sleeping Danny could be heard advising Hamilton to craft the story of a rope consultant to explain the cheat. So for us to come out and say the ideal Look at this account, there's no cheating. Uh, it's going to be tough to sell. Now, on the other hand, I think if what, if what we can do is to say, we've studied it. We know that sometimes it was used, sometimes it was not. These are these limited times are the times it was used. These people are being refunded. I think for the public, it just has to be former consultant to the company, uh, took advantage of a server flaw by hacking in the client been able to identify exactly when sometimes he played with it, sometimes he played without it. And because he knew there were high-profile players who will not shut up to downplay the amount of money scammed from 50 million to 5 million. What do you, what do you, how do you think this money, if, you, if it's supposed it's a 5 million, which Greg thinks it could be right around 5 million, if you had to pay players and give KG, what is it, KG to see? If we can get it down to 5, I'd be happy. And then, shifting blame to another holding company, forcing shareholders to pay instead. Uh, in order to get to Xcaps' money legally, they almost, they almost have to show fraud. Yeah, no, so to get to shift responsibility to Xcaps, which is my short goal. What I said is a new news. CoinGeek reminded the crypto community about this connection in August 2021, and a documentary was released in 2017 about those scandals. And then this year, New Genesis, a blockchain project which got screwed over by Alameda Research. Right? And he's arguing at the point, and I'm saying, what is the liquidity you guys have dumped on the market? Because I didn't even know they were going to be selling our coin on the market. Yeah. Right? So all of a sudden, we know that they, we hear is we realize that John had been the guy behind it. The Alameda was the one dumping the coin. Alameda set the price. Alameda dropped our value. And Alameda was the one that's putting 200 million new coin on market in one go on an exchange which had hardly any trade on it. Yeah. You know, the whole exchange. This is liquid. Licked a Zoom call with Dan Friedberg where he admitted the counterfeiting of crypto and bribed New Genesis to shut up. No, I'm just saying, you guys should have accepted the offer. Okay, by you insulting you me, no, 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 what, by you insulting me and us right now, what did you th think, what, what did you try to, what did you think you were going to achieve? I was hoping that uh, possibly to save uh, Hussein from imprisonment. Hussein from imprisonment because you counterfeited coin. No, because I'm a kind man, Hussein. Okay? And I'm just saying that, that, you that you'll notice that the poker case is eerily similar to the current FTX one, where owners of a corporation use software in a highly unregulated market to play against their own customers, cheat them out of life-changing amounts of money, then pay an amount of shut-up fee. Remember that messed up organizational chart? That's the least of four guys in case anything goes wrong. Almost as if there's a term for this. Someone's habit or pattern of criminal behavior. Hmm, meth and shady lawyers. Where have I heard that before? Danny runs the laser tag. Danny is the guy who had a vision. Where others saw a dirt lot, he saw black lights, rubber aliens, teenagers running around with ray guns, right? It was like Bugsy Siegel in the desert. And without going into a deeper rabbit hole which may send people knocking on my door, the kind of rabbit hole that asks, is Dan Friedberg the real mastermind behind the whole operation? Anyway, those are just the red flags anyone could have spotted if, say, they wanted to invest millions of dollars into FTX. Like, for instance, Tamasic, the Singaporean investment company owned by the Singaporean government, which invested $210 million. Names like that tend to give the impression of legitimacy, luring individual investors to put their money into FTX, which may explain why Singaporean users accounted for the second largest share of web traffic to FTX.com, 
What people may not realize is that $210 million is merely 0.09% of the portfolio. The equivalent investment for, say, someone with an extra $10,000 to invest is $9. The big funds giving FTX that legitimacy are definitely fine. They simply dropped the burger on the ground and said, well, I guess I've skipped lunch, just throwing $9 at the mahjong table. The ones that get fucked are the retail investors who get blinded by the actions of big actors like the media, who give credence to these scammers by plastering ads all over the place. Mark Cohodes, a well-known short seller, actually went forward to Bloomberg with information to do an investigation into FTX months before the collapse. I went to Bloomberg with my pal who I was working on this thing with, and we laid it out to five crypto, five ladies on the crypto team, and they passed and they said it would be too much work. We'd lose access. It's bad for business, right? They'd hang up on us if we asked these questions. When, when anyone tries to pin SBF down on where he made his money, you can't get a cogent answer. And, and in his trade, you needed real money up front in the place on this country crypto arbitrage to make big money. Right. And it's simple things as who financed you, because you clearly didn't have the money. You clearly didn't have the money. Rates are up, crypto's down, usage is down, trading is down, everything's down. So where the fuck does FTX make its money? Where do they make their money? And let's not forget that Google also operates on ad money, money which FTX freely gave away. How do they have so much money to spend on sponsoring us when they don't even convert that well? We don't know, but FTX says they just have a lot of money that they have to spend. And I'm like, this is stupid. This is a bubble. Whatever. And the algorithms Google writes determines who and what gets promoted to you, such as finance YouTubers, which is really the main reason why I made this video. So, a disclaimer, I didn't lose any money on FTX and I only have $100 in crypto. This video is simply my perspective as a non-finance YouTuber who is angry about this whole situation. Many finance YouTubers have been paid to ask people to put money into FTX. Sponsor in today's video as always, uh, FTX US. If you and before we move on, a quick message from FTX US who sponsored this video as always. And that's where a sponsor FTX US comes in. You probably know them. It's FTX US, which is one of the largest US regulated crypto exchanges. Check out our sponsor today, FTX. Reportedly at a rate of $50,000 a month for smaller channels which I should remind you that at least one of them suspected was going to collapse. And then, you know, I go to log on to FTX and here I'm still greeted with this thing, earn up to 8% on your funds. And I'm just like, <laughs> I just don't trust it, man. Like, come on, like, 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 you know, with everything that's going on, I'm just like, seriously, like this whole earn 8% on your money and 6% and all this stuff. I'm just like, you know, especially with everything that's going on in the crypto market, I do not feel comfortable with this at all. I have to decide if I want to do more, but know that if I'm doing more, it's just a cash grab because <laughs> I got 10 days to make these videos. But hey, I'm going to be transparent about it. Hey, it's a lot of money. It's like, you know, a couple thousand bucks a video and uh, for 30 seconds, read, whatever. Why are you paying five to 7% for, for my cash? And obviously they're lending it out. But the problem is when people sign up for this, it's not entirely clear that their money is being lent out. It's surprising to me that it's taken them nine months to talk about this. But state regulators say some interest-bearing accounts linked uh, or with billions of dollars in deposits appear to be unregistered securities that aren't disclosing their risks to investors. The warnings come out of states uh, like New Jersey, Alabama, and Kentucky, which are among the states which have brought actions against BlockFi and its affiliates. Which, by the way, if you want to sign up for BlockFi, make sure to go to metkevin.com slash BF. Block five. <laughs> a steak sponsorship. Oh man, someone asked me this. What's before. your price? Everyone, I feel like everyone has a price. Hundred million a year. <laughs> I don't know because it, it has to be a point where it where it's so high that I would be irresponsible for saying no to it. And if you completed the the sponsorship, let's say a year later, and your audience turned into you, would you be comfortable with the money? In the pushback. I, yeah, part if, of me if feels If all four like, million DM'd you on Instagram yeah. and said, we hate you because of this. I don't know, because I feel like part of my audience it understands the financial aspect of it. And I feel like they would be like, yo, Graham, you're an idiot if you say no to this. Like, we get it. I, I'm hoping that, that that would be the response. It's just a cash grab. <laughs> I think that you all deserve me to talk about FTX and what's going on because I was... 
There's been a lot of craziness around crypto and FTX particularly. So I wanted to make this quick video. It's completely raw. It's unscripted. So, so I've been waiting to talk about this since the situation seems to be changing every few minutes. But as some of you may have seen, FTX US has been a sponsor here on the channel for the majority of the year. Number one, I was working strictly solely with FTX US. So I began working with FTX US earlier in 2022 and by the time i began working with ftx us ftx.com which is the international division had already spun off and you have these two companies their international counterpart however ftx.com has recently faced liquidity issues disabled withdrawals and because of one-to-one -one and they're operating normally in fact you're still able to buy sell and withdrawal as usual although still buy and sell crypto you can still pull your crypto out and so the platform is still working FTX US was the only company I work with and they're 100% operational. You can buy, you can sell crypto, you can pull your money out, you can put your money in. And so my big concern is what happens when things go wrong. And I was reassured multiple times and I have writings of this that FTX US is well capitalized. And they gave me a lot of assurances to know that the money people will put on that platform will be 100% safe. As much as I trusted the information that I was given, I was wrong and I'm sorry. I trusted them, but in the end, their parent company was not forthcoming with all of the risks, uh, this being one of them. This you don't want to risk spillover or bleed over from the FTX.com company into the US subsidiary. I'd rather be overly cautious and remind people to move their money off of the exchange, especially during a time where everything is still functioning. I, I think going forward, I can assure you that I will make sure to be extra, extra careful so that nothing like this ever happens again. You bet that me and my team are going to be even stricter than we are already. And second, we're going to be working to make sure that all of you who trusted us and who trust us are okay and taken care of because I want to make sure that this is right. I'm. Everybody who watches the channel means the world to me and I would not be here without you. So thank you so much for hearing this out and I really hope this is all for nothing. And uh, hopefully you guys can put your trust in me to do the best job I can on your behalf. Quick videos, completely raw, it's unscripted. So During the failures of Three Arrows Capital and Voyager in May this year, these so-called finance YouTubers also advised their audience to keep their crypto in FTX rather than in cold wallets. Of course, these videos were already taken down. The obvious problem is that these so-called finance YouTubers put themselves as experts on the topic of finance. Most of them aren't. Meet Kevin and Stephen Graham, ex-real estate agents, and Andre Jig started off his YouTube channel making magic tricks before moving on to his greatest magic trick to make your wallet disappear. Andre is also a guy who three years ago posted on Wall Street Bets asking people to explain what options are. Usually, their advice is followed by saying, this is not financial advice. An incredibly suspicious sentence, considering that they just told people to put money into a product promising them returns. Kinda like an investment, except it's not? Or I guess we, we could say a product that revolves around money, a, a financial product of, of sorts. And, and then given their perceived expertise on the topic of finance, they're recommending you to do something, so, so sort of like... I, I can't find the word for it. It starts with an A. Uh, 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 something related to finance. I, I can't quite feel this, this blank in. But as the YouTube channel New Money, which didn't receive money from FTX, pointed out, Australian financial influencers are not allowed to say anything that might even imply a buy or sell recommendation. Promoting a link to a trading platform is also an example that is not allowed. Of course, FTX isn't Australian. But the point is that it's stupid to not consider these things financial advice. And other finance YouTubers who didn't receive money from FTX have made videos talking about the finance YouTubers who did. Like Chris Nolan, who months ago pointed out that Graham Stephan, Andre Jig, Meet Kevin, The Minority Mindset, Tom Nash, all conveniently share the same agency. Um, this is the agency where most of your financial YouTubers work. And in fact, maybe all of them work there. Um, it's called Creators Agency. This is why, and I just made a video this morning that uh, Graham, Stefan, and Andre Zeke, that their videos look the same because they're most likely edited by the same people. Um, I mean, literally, it could be the same person in the same room. Now, that I don't know. I don't know the name of the person who edits their videos, but it's called, it's creatorsagency.co. Graham Stefan's there. Andre Zeke, meet Kevin. They're all the same agency, right? Um, Ryan Seahurt, Nate O'Brien, which I don't like. I know who this guy is. I don't like him. 
minority mindset. I used to like him, but he did the whole FTX thing because he signed with the same agency. And it was interesting too, which I wouldn't have guessed. But Ricky Gutierrez, the 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 one one of the, I mean, he's totally a scammer. Uh, he also works with that agency. So does Brian Jung, who is also a, a scammer. They they put you know some people and they don't put others. So I don't know why Tom Nash or the Jeremy Financial isn't necessarily on this list. But this is the agency where they all essentially are represented by. So they essentially get all of the deals for them for sponsored videos and stuff like that, and then edit their videos and guide content and stuff like that. That's what an agency does. And then there's the other defense that. Oh, these YouTubers need this sponsorship because otherwise they wouldn't have money. As a small YouTube channel with only 1,000 subs, that is gigantic Godzilla-sized prehistoric bullshit. These people already have enough money from views, which in the first place pays one of the highest among the various niches. Nobody fucking needs to take shady sponsorships at the expense of their audience. It's just greed. This is a three bedroom, three and a half bathroom, 3,300 square foot single story house. Home itself is just over 3,800 square feet, four bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms, and two offices. Meaning the grand total on this house is $1,411,000 right around there roughly. So I bought this house for $1,330,000 with a seven to one adjustable rate mortgage and a 20% down payment. Purchase price of $1,440,000. Then at night, we've got these really cool spotlights that automatically turn on and that illuminates the entire backyard while creating such a cool atmosphere in the middle of the desert. A little hangout spot with a built-in barbecue, a built-in fridge, and of course, the star of the show, which is the pool itself with this water feature, all powered by solar power, which came with the house. Oh, Squidward! You're never gonna believe it! A giant blue lip clam ate me millions dollars! <laughs> I lost me dollar and I'll never get it back. Never, never. <laughs> they don't do the research to provide value, instead always chasing the most clicks with some stupid fucking clickbait title and the dumbest looking faces. Which, if they did the research, would have landed them on the red flags in the first half of this video. Or maybe they didn't care, which seems more likely to be the case. It's just a cash grab. <laughs> then they push the responsibility of being part of the media by saying things like do your own research after wasting their time with a 15 minute video of them reading the news. No, research is your fucking job. You do the work, read and verify the information, then interpret and tell us what it means and what people would miss. Don't stretch an article you can read in 5 minutes to a 15 fucking minute video. You know what I do to make a 15 minutes video? Like, look at this paragraph here. I talk about New Genesis. Just to write these two sentences, I have to watch a 3 hour video just to understand if I'm not saying random bullshit. Then I process the information and decide that the additional context adds little value to non-crypto, non-finance viewers. Why do I do this? Because part of adding value to content is making sure that you don't say unnecessary or the wrong things. Like how doctors do differential diagnosis to determine if you have a cough. Part of research is making sure that you don't mistakenly give the wrong conclusions. Literally thousands of new YouTubers looked at various niches, thought about the value and expertise they can bring, and then create content on that. Those thousands of YouTubers, many of whom failed, didn't create dog shit content chasing some high CPM niche they didn't understand. They put money on the table because they knew it wasn't the right thing to do. So for me, I had a good run creating Genshin Impact recipes, going from a few hundred to a few thousand views. You know why I stopped making them? Because I started to realize that the game's monetization system was harmful to players and could do damage to people's psychology. Then, I created a one hour video criticizing Genshin Impact and stopped producing those videos. I could have followed these other recipe channels, who also went from a few thousand views to hundreds of thousands of views. The growth trajectory justified it, but I didn't, because I thought it was the right thing to do. If a doctor prescribes the wrong medication or causes harm to their patients, they lose their license. There's no justice if these charlatans don't get what they deserve. In my opinion, they shouldn't even be allowed to post YouTube videos anymore. Google shouldn't even be promoting their videos anymore. Yeah, YouTubers don't need a license, but you know who gave them the unofficial license? Those millions of subscribers. I have 1000 subs. That's like me talking to a school. 4 million, that's one fucking country. Imagine going out your door and everybody is a subscriber. Why these people don't care? You are just numbers. Numbers to make their bank account bigger. And if there are no consequences for them, you are going to see YouTube become more of a public toilet. More jokesters creating shitty content. Why the fuck not? There's no consequence. Just say what's popular and get views. Take the money from shady sponsorships and run away. Why even spend time cultivating something? Why try to make the world a better place?